Hey, good morning, Crosswind Church. How's everybody this morning? Good. Hey, my name is Bentley. I'm a home group leader here at Crosswind. And whether you're watching online or you're here with us this morning, we want to say welcome and we are glad that you're here. If today is your first Sunday here at Crosswind Church, we'd like to ask you to stop by the Welcome Center on your way out. We have a gift waiting for you. There are three things that I want to tell you. If you're, if you're new to Crosswind, you should know that Crosswind Kids is open for babies through children in the fifth grade. So you can find Crosswind Kids by going down this orange hallway on your right where we have volunteers waiting to greet your child. We have a mom room. So if you're a mom and you're keeping your baby close, check out the mom room in this corner. We have rockers and monitors so you won't miss anything going on out here. And then our starting point room. Uh, back in this corner of the auditorium, at the end of the service, if you have a question about the message or you want someone to pray with you or talk to you about taking your next steps, meet us in the starting point room at the end of the service. There are three, uh, there are four, I always say three, but there are four ways to give here at Crosswind Church. So you can use the offering boxes in the back of the auditorium, the Crosswind Church website, or the Crosswind Church app. And now the fourth one, you can use Venmo. So it's at Crosswind Church. It's on the screen. Easter is four weeks away. Anybody excited about Easter? Yeah? So if you don't want to go out and buy a new outfit, you can buy a T-shirt. So we are selling T-shirts through the Crosswind Church app, and the T-shirts will support Crosswind missions that are going on this year. So check that out and order a T-shirt today. If uh, you are interested in serving here at Crosswind, if that's the next step that you need to take in your faith journey, you can go to the Crosswind Church app, and you can find different ways for you to serve here at Crosswind. So if, if that's the next step for you, check that out or stop by the Welcome Center. We can find a, a way for you to volunteer and serve here at the church. We're so glad that you decided to join us here. Please stand and join us in worship. Sons and daughters, bowing blood and 
washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Oh, our God will finish what He started. Oh, this is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. I'm Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony, this is my testimony. If I'm not dead, you're not done. dead, you're not done. Sing it out, church. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. You're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony oh I'm alive this is my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify I'm Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony, this is my testimony.
worship matter? Why do we, why do we praise? What's our reason? And sometimes it can be as simple as I woke up this morning because God could have not let that happen. <laughs> but if I'm not dead, he's not done. Amen. And uh, just simplest things. My, you know, I woke up this morning. There was food in the fridge. Maybe you ate breakfast. Maybe you skipped it. There was, uh, my car started this morning. Hallelujah. Been there when that didn't work. You know, there was a roof over my head. God, you saved me. God, you rescued me. You've brought me this far. You're not going to leave me for the second half. You're going to go with me. And so I just want you to just take a moment. Just close your eyes. Just think of one, one thing. You can think of more, but just try and come up with at least one thing, one reason to praise God. God. And it can just be as simple as, God, I thank you for the air that I am breathing that you woke me up this morning. Maybe it's more complex than that. Maybe you're walking through the valley right now and you're going, God, I don't feel you with me, but I'm going to praise you anyway. I'm going to praise you when I'm going through the storm. I'm going to praise you in the valley and in the dark times in life. God, I'm going to praise you when I'm on the mountaintop and life is easy and you are with me. But just find that one reason to praise because there are so many. Maybe it's as simple as, God, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for raising yourself from the dead, forgiving us of our sins. God, we praise you this morning. Thank you, Jesus. When I 
grace my fears relieve how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood His mercy reigns unending Lord, we thank you for your amazing grace. God, we thank you that even while we were yet still sinners, you loved us because nothing can separate us from your love, God. I pray that you've been glorified, you've been praised this morning, Lord. I pray that you would help us to always find the reasons to praise you throughout the week, God. We thank you that you are worshiped and glorified. We thank you that you let us enter into your throne room join the angels in a chorus of praising you and crying out, holy, holy, holy. God, because that is what you are and that is what you do. Can't wait to see you face to face. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to go ahead and highlight a couple opportunities. I know Bentley 
mentioned to you all that we were looking for some folks to serve. Maybe you were looking for a place to plug in and serve here at Crosswind Church. There's two uh, opportunities that I want to make sure that you all are aware of. Uh, Both of them, you'll check the same spot on the app. Uh, or if you're not an app person, just stop by the starting point room after the service. Um, They both have to do with media and technology. Uh, First and foremost, uh, we have a team uh, every Sunday uh, that is back here that runs sound and lighting and tech stuff. And I know that maybe some of you all, in fact, this this fits right in with what we're going to talk about when we open up the Bible here in just a minute. But some of you all probably look at that and go, man, I don't have the ability to do that. I don't have the expertise. I don't know anything about technology. I barely turned my computer on. It's, it's okay. I want you to know all the training that you need, uh, we give you. We teach you how to do everything. Uh, and so even if you're coming in at a zero Trust me, uh, we can teach you how to do some of this stuff, and so we could use your help there. The other is something that's brand new, and and I'm super excited about this. Uh, For those of you especially that are watching online, uh, we are trying our best to figure out ways we can better engage you and meet you all online where you are. And so some of you all that are here in person, you may want to help out with that. And so uh, we're looking for folks uh, that, that will be willing to help us engage some of our online uh, crew that meets with us every week, uh, literally from all over the country, they meet with us. And so uh, if those are the things you're interested in, you can go to the app, be sure you check Technology and media is a place you want to, uh, to to volunteer, or if you just want to know more about any of those opportunities, the starting point room is where we'll be after the service here for that. That having been said, I'll, I'll tell you this: it is a wonderful time of year. It's not my favorite time of the year, uh, but it's because it, that's the fall when college football hits. But um, but but in the spring, it's really neat because the weather starts to get a little warmer. And uh, for a little boy that grew up in Kentucky, it's basketball time. Like, we are in full basketball swing, right? When I grew up in Kentucky, basketball was king. You, you chose uh, a team when you were little. I don't know where you have to, like, declare it or whatever, but it's either Kentucky or Louisville. Those were the two that you had the opportunity. We both hated Tennessee, so it was all okay. And, and, um, and, and that was just kind of what it was. Growing up, you would watch basketball, and we'd get close to March and March Madness and it was so cool because whether you liked basketball or not this time of year, everybody's doing like brackets. You're filling out brackets. And whether you're filling it out based on a coin toss or because you think that, you know, a lion would beat a mountaineer or in a fight or whatever. I don't know how you choose your teams. Everybody seems to do it. In middle school and high school, we had all these illegal gambling rings that went on uh, that we all participated in. It was just, it's a spectacular time of year. And as much as I loved basketball growing up, uh, I was not what you'd call a big dude. Uh, I was a small guy and, and, and never translated into actually playing the sport because, uh, again, I, I, you know, you have to have some height uh, or at least a little bit of athletic ability to be able to, uh, to do basketball. And so I just never was able to do that. But around 9 or 10 years old or so, uh, maybe in that range, maybe 8, 9, 10 uh, years old, uh, I got introduced to another reason why this is a great time of year, and that is it's spring training for baseball, Right? Baseball is going on, and when I got introduced to baseball in elementary school, I got introduced in a way that just in reality would never happen today. Uh, we actually had at, at our playground at my elementary school kind of a sandlot field up on the hill, and we had a bat and we had a baseball that our teachers had bought for us, and every day in recess, we would go and we would play baseball. Some of us had gloves, some of us did not. Um, we definitely didn't have any catcher's equipment, but we definitely had pitchers and catchers uh, that play. I'm not surprised that no one got concussion. We probably did get concussions. Only a few bloody noses, that sort of thing. There's no way in the world that our kids would be allowed to do this on the playground today. But I grew to love this sport of baseball, playing on the playground. And so when I went to my parents and I said, hey, I want to sign up to play baseball uh, in the park league, they, they didn't hesitate to do it. But it was my great grandpa, and I've told you all this before, my grandpa that really instilled in me the love of baseball. And what I love about baseball is you don't necessarily have to be the biggest, the strongest, the fastest uh, in order to contribute to your team in baseball. Uh, and what grandpa taught me early on was this, and, and at first it was a little bit of, of, you know, a gut punch, but later on you start thinking about it and he's right. 
I remember Grandpa sitting me down and him going, Jeremy, you're never going to be the guy that hits the ball over the fence. That's not you. And the thing is, is you, you want to be that guy, right? But the more you start thinking about it, you're like, yeah, that's right. I'm not. I'm not going to be that guy. He said, but let me tell you what you can do. You can out-hustle everybody. And in baseball, you can outsmart everybody. You can know what all is going on in the field better than everybody else. You can pay more attention. You can be a better teammate. You can get on base. You can, you can be fast and quick, and you can contribute to your team, and you can be a part of some teams and help some teams that win by doing that. And as a result, I just fell in love with the game of baseball because Grandpa said it's all about these intangibles, these things that you don't necessarily see by looking at the player that, that can make a player great. And he was exactly right. I, 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 I ate baseball, and I drank baseball, and I, I breathed it, and I talked about it, and I, it was every, I collected baseball cards, and, and there was just, I, it was, it, I was completely eat up with it as a kid. I, I, I talked up my other players that were on my team, and I, I made sure that I coached them up. When I was on the field, I was helping direct people where they were supposed to go. I knew where the ball was supposed to go at every particular time. I studied uh, rules and, and trying to figure out the best way to, to kind of manipulate situations so we could win. And guess what? I was a part of some teams that won some games. I even made an all-star team or two along the way just because I knew things that other players didn't know and I did the things that no one else wanted to do. It was about the intangibles. In, in fact, it's this same kind of principle that, that played itself out uh, in a book and a movie called Moneyball. Maybe you guys have seen it. The movie came out in 2011 and it documented the true story of the Oakland Athletics and their general manager, a guy named Billy Bean. And Billy Bean could not compete with all of the other baseball teams that had big budgets and could pay for what they called five-tool players. Let me explain what that means. In baseball, the way that scouts would judge players is based on five tools. It was their ability to hit, their ability to hit with power, uh, their speed on the base pass, their running, their ability to throw, and their fielding ability. And these were things that were very easily seen. And in baseball, they tracked them on a regular basis. It was their batting average, their number of extra base hits, home runs, that sort of thing, stolen bases. And they could literally track these things. And they would, they would talk about players by saying they're a three-tool player or they're a five-tool player. Maybe, maybe you guys remember Barry Bonds, who owns the home run record with the asterisk because he was probably hyped up on steroids. But he, he was a five-tool player. He stole bases. He was fast around the base pass. You could stick him in the outfield, and you weren't afraid that he was going to make a bunch of mistakes while he was out there. He had good batting average. He hit for power. He, he had all of the tools, and as a result, he, he required the most amount of money. Well, the Oakland Athletics of the early 2000s couldn't afford players like him. So they began to ask questions. Are there, are there other things? Are there, are there things we don't see that matter? Are there things that we can recruit players on that, that maybe other people aren't looking for? And, and, and in that search, they, they discovered what was called sabermetrics. These are, these are new ways of evaluating baseball players based on things that no one else saw. So they began to ask questions like, does this player get out a lot? And if the player got out a lot, they didn't want the player. That gave them lower ranking. It, does the player get on base when he comes up to bat? more often than he doesn't get on base. And if he did, that raised him up a certain level. And, and we began to think about statistics in baseball and the way we measured players completely different based on things that we never had seen before, things that were just lurking just below the surface, things my grandpa would have said much earlier, those, those intangibles, those things that make somebody a good teammate. Now, the reality is, I know some of you are not baseball things, but this, or, or even sports fans, but the, this principle finds its way in every aspect and every avenue of our life. This is this idea of looking just beneath the surface at, at the things that no one else looks at. Well, we know this is true in so many other areas of our life. In fact, if you have ever hired someone or been at a job where someone was being hired, you understand the value of the intangible. 
Because you can have someone that gets hired at your company or, or for your business that checks all of the boxes. They have all of the right education. They have all of the right expertise. They have all of the skill sets that they need to do the job. But when they get hired into your company or onto your business or when they become your coworker, they're like a cancer that just eats away at everything that's there because they just don't seem to fit the way that they need to fit. Here at Crosswind Church, when we think about hiring people, we, we think about three C's all the time. We think about the three C's. We think about competency. These are the things that the boxes that everybody checks. Can they do what they want to do? But we also think about character. We, is this a good person? Is their competency, is their skill set going to put them on a platform that their character can't sustain? Right? Right? And then the last thing we think about is we think about chemistry. So when we hire somebody at church here at Crosswind, we always have a lunch where we go to lunch with our staff and we sit around the table as a staff and, and, and we try not to talk about work. We try just to talk about just stuff. And afterwards, I sit down with, with our staff team and our search team wants to know that the results of this meeting and our elders want to know the results of this meeting. We, hey, is this person going to fit or is it going to be awkward? Are we going to want them around the office, or are we going to dread it when they step into our, our, our cubicle, right? Because we know that there's more beyond just checking off of the boxes. If you've ever been in a place of employment, you've seen this. Also, if you've ever tried to date somebody, you get this, right? There's more than just what you see. Because so, how, how many of you? I mean, we could just pass the mic around, right? I mean, you saw her across the room, and you were like, man. She is hot. Then you got to know her, and you're like, man, she is crazy. <laughs> right? And you're just like, there is just, there is just something that just isn't right with her. Right? More often than not, though, it's, it's women. You go, oh, man, look at him. He He's a total package, right? I mean, you could tell he's been working out, and he's got a great job, and he's got all kinds of money, and, and then you, 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 you go out to eat with him, and you're like, no, it's just, not, it's just not there, right? Like, it's just like the elevator isn't quite going all the way up. He, he seems to check all the boxes on the outside, but there's something rotten on the inside with him. Come on, we get this in all kinds of areas of life. And the reality is, I think so many of us, when we start to kind of look inside of our own selves and we take a look in the mirror, I think we, we like to size ourselves up all the time, too, by what we see. We like, we like to look at ourselves in the mirror and we like to either think too highly of ourselves because we check all of the right boxes or, or we don't think highly enough of ourselves because we don't meet the criteria that we think we ought to meet. I mean, th think about it. Have you ever looked in the mirror and you go, look, I don't understand why I'm getting passed up for all of the promotions. I don't know why I'm not getting the job. I don't know why I'm not getting the guy or the girl. I don't know why I'm not getting ahead. I've got all the education. I've got all the experience. I've got all of the tick marks that, kinda, that I should have, and yet it's not working out for me. I, I have to admit, as a young pastor, I, I fell into this trap <laughs> more often than I'd like to admit. When I first started pastoring, I can remember I, I got hired at a, at a small country church uh, that was trying to transition from more of a, tra a traditional type model to more that was a little more blended, a little more contemporary. They wanted to reach some younger folks. And I went in and, and, and at 29 years old and just, just, just started trying to make changes and doing things. And I kept getting pushback from people. And I can remember going home at night going, I'm so frustrated. Don't they know that I went to school to learn how to do this? Don't they know that I've been studying that? They haven't, they haven't studied theology. They haven't had a job in a church. They don't know. And I was only looking at the criteria that I felt like I was supposed to meet to do the job. There was something else inside of me that I was missing out on. Maybe even more often than not, there's so many of you that go, you know what, I know that there's something on my heart that I'm supposed to be doing. Maybe even something for the Lord that I'm supposed to be doing. I know that I've been called to more. 
I know that my friends need to hear about Jesus. I know that there are children that need me to minister to them in our church. I know that my neighbor needs to hear about the gospel or that my family needs to know about what Jesus can do and why life with Jesus is better. But you know what? I, I don't know the Bible well enough. I, I, I won't be able to answer all of their questions. I, I don't, I, listen, I'm not smart enough to serve in that role, to be in that role. There's no way in the world. And we write ourselves off. I think too many times in the church world, we look at folks that get up on stages like me, like Daniel, like Garrett, and we go, I can't do what they do. So there's no way in the world that God could use me. And we couldn't be more wrong. Because throughout the story of the Bible and throughout the history of his church, God routinely uses the least likely individuals to do the greatest things for his kingdom. God routinely takes the people that don't check off all of the boxes and he hands them the reins, in some cases, to his kingdom and says, now go and do what it is that I've called you to do. It seems to always be the impoverished, the weak, the young, the old, the sick, right? It's, it's the outcast, it's the lame, it's the individuals that no one would ever call upon that God seems to call to do great things for his kingdom, not necessarily the ones that check off all of the boxes. And so that's what this series is about. The series is about you taking a look inside of your own heart and saying, what is it that's really there? What is it that's more than meets the eye? Are there things that God maybe needs to prune out of my life? A, an unholy pride that I have in myself and the boxes that I tick off that maybe God needs to do something in me before he can use me. Or maybe it's because I'm selling God too short in my own life that there's something he's called me to do that, that, that I have not stepped into because I don't believe he could use someone like me. That's what the Dark Horses series is about. It's about looking at men and women that no one else expected to be used by God and how God used them to advance his kingdom. And today, we get to start with one who's actually kind of famous. In fact, you've, you've heard of him. It's about a shepherd boy uh, that would ultimately become the king over all of Israel. His story is told in, in, in 1 Samuel, and that's where we're going to read primarily from today. 1 Samuel chapter 16, if you want to turn there in your Bibles or, or scroll there on your, your smartphones or apps or just watch on the screen uh, with us. Uh, we'll have all the words up there for you to read along with. 1 Samuel chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Now, you may or may not know how we got to this point, so let me give you a little bit of background. The nation of Israel has been planted literally in this, what we call the holy land by God himself. He's given them this land, even though they didn't earn it or deserve it. And, and he has uh, removed the people that had been living there and, and given them this land uh, because he had promised it to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. And while they were there, uh, he began to set up a what we call a theocracy. This is where a, a God would be their king, and they would follow God directly, and he would send prophets that would help uh, to direct and to, and to lead the people into what it is that God would have them to do. Uh, but along the way, they came across some enemies, and God would raise up what are called judges, and we read about that in, in the book of Judges in the Old Testament, to lead them against their enemies, and those judges would fade away, and they would have other judges that would come in. And towards the end of the book of Judges, what we see is the nation of Israel looked at all of the other kingdoms that were around them and said, we want to be like them. We want a king. And Samuel, who was a prophet at the time, he, he went to them and he said, you don't want a king, trust me. You get a king, he's going to have your sons come, and he's going to put them in the military. He's going to have them fight for him. He's going to have them serve him in the capital city. He's going to make you pay taxes. No one wants to pay taxes. You don't want a king. And they're like, no, give us a king. And so God said, okay, give them a king. 
And so Samuel anointed a man named Saul to be the king over Israel. And Saul was one of those guys that checked all of the boxes. We're told that he was a head taller than everybody else in Israel. We were told that there was not anyone in all of Israel that was more handsome than Saul. If we were in high school and we were doing superlatives, Saul would be voted most likely to succeed. He would be voted like Mr. UCHS or, 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 or Mr. OCCHS, right? Like he would have been, he would have been elected the, 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 the best, the brightest. He, there was no question he was the man that was going to be king. And so he became the king over Israel. But eventually he began to rebel against God, to do things that he shouldn't do, to offer sacrifices when he shouldn't offer sacrifices, to make moves that he shouldn't be making, uh, that God had called him to not make. He would do it anyway. And, and, And eventually what happened is God said, I've rejected Saul as the king. And this grieved Samuel's heart. Samuel was sad because ultimately Samuel was one that put Saul in place and so, and so here in chapter 16, verse 1, we see God come to Samuel and says, how long are you going to grieve? Look, I've got another king. I want you to go anoint another king. Now, the only problem with this is that Samuel was being asked to go anoint a king when Israel already had a king. You see the problem with that, right? Like, if I go and anoint another king, we've got a king, and then this other king's not going to be happy, and things aren't going to go the way that they're supposed to go. And so Samuel voices this to God. Look at verse 2 and following. He says this, verse 2, but Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you. Heifer is just a fun word to say, by the way. Anyway, take a heifer with you. And say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you are to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said, and when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him, and they asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. I just have to say this. This is really not, you know, this is like a bonus kind of thing here. But does it bother you a little bit that God uses what we might call deceit here? That, that, that really, it's, it's, it's not really why Samuel's coming to see Jesse is to offer the sacrifice. But, I mean, he is going to offer the sacrifice. He's not necessarily lying, but he's not necessarily telling the whole truth. And, 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 and sometimes that may seem just a little, bit, a little bit deceitful to us. It may feel just a little bit odd to us. And, and, and just to kind of t- t- talk about that for just a minute, if you will, Jody and I have been watching... Uh, a television show called Suits, which is about uh, high-end lawyers in New York City. And what they like to do is, like, find out where the line is between what's legal and what's illegal and, like, go right up to the edge of the line. They don't want to do something illegal, you know, that, that, that can cause them to get disbarred. But at the same time, uh, they, they want to make sure that they get the right circumstances to kind of come together so they get what it is that they want. And, and, and it just feels kind of just gross sometimes. And we might read this and we might think, you know what, it feels just a little bit gross as well. But in, 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 in saying that, I also want to remind you that Jesus, uh, about a thousand years later, he would say this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. He says, I'm sending you, this is to his disciples, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves, therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. As Christians, I think a lot of times we get this innocent as dove part, but we forget this shrewd as snakes part. We need to recognize that we are at war with an enemy that is out to get us, and we ought to be wise about how we go about accomplishing God's work for his kingdom. There is a um, crisis pregnancy center here in northwest Tennessee that, that a few years ago posted some bulletin boards, some, uh, what do they call them, some billboards, uh, that, that, that intentionally utilized language that was used by, by pro-choice uh, uh, and by abortion clinics they use the same type of language on their billboards. 
And, and as we were talking with them, they, they shared with me that some pastors were a little uncomfortable because it felt deceitful. And when they said that to me, I, I quoted this Matthew passage. I was like, we need to be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. And they're like, we say that to our staff every single day. We are at war with an enemy that wants to take us out. We must be as innocent as doves. We need to not sin in the name of Jesus. But we need to recognize that we need to be as shrewd as serpents. And here we see God and Samuel being shrewd. For them to tip their hand early that that Saul was being usurped as a king would not serve David or the nation of Israel the way that it needed to be served. And so he comes offering this sacrifice. There's no indication here at all that, that, that Samuel even tells Jesse at this point what the plan is. And so they go to offer the sacrifice, they, they, they bring in all of the sons, and, and they have this offering. And then in verse 6, we read this. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, and he thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. Eliab is the firstborn. He's the eldest. This just makes sense. It's the firstborn that gets all of the benefits, right? He checks the right boxes. He's tall. He's handsome. That's who's going to be the Lord's anointed. This is the guy that's going to be the next king of Israel. Verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider the appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. <clears throat> the Lord does not look at things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. In other words, here you go. Look, <clears throat> there's, there's an intangible here that we want to look at. There's something underneath the surface. It's not a, it's not a check mark that everyone would think it would be. It's, it's not his height or his, his, his status in the family or what people think about him it's about what's going on on the inside, and what's going on the inside has caused me to reject him. In other words, in other words, if we could kind of whittle it down, he might say, it's what's in the person that makes the person. It's what's in the man that makes the man. It's what's in the woman that makes, makes the woman. It's what's in the person that makes the person. And what is unseen is more important than what is seen. To God, what's unseen is what is more important than what is seen. What happens behind closed doors? What happens when no one else is looking? What happens when it's just God and the individual? That is what it is. That is the most important thing to God. It appears Jesse now understands what's going on. Maybe there was a conversation, I don't know, between Samuel and Jesse because now it's like, it's like uh, a Miss America pageant at this point. Look at verse 8. It said, Then Jesse called Aminadab as he had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. And Jesse had Shema pass by, but Samuel said, no, no, the Lord has not chosen this one. And Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. One by one, the sons come by in front of Samuel, and every time I can only imagine Samuel, maybe even in his own heart, is like, oh, no, it's not him. Oh, no, it's not him. Oh, maybe the next one, maybe it's, maybe it's him. And then they have to have this awkward conversation. This is kind of like a, an Ako taco type of moment, right? First Samuel chapter 16, verse 11, the very first part he says, uh, do you have any more sons? Is there, is there anybody else? Like all of these others, like they're, I mean, they're nice and everything. And I'm sure that they're going to be great guys, but like it's not them. That's not, that's not who it is God is going to call. Jesse responds. He says, there is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. And Samuel said, sin for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. <laughs> I mean, this is, wrap your head around this. They didn't even think to invite him. That's how insignificant David was to his family. 
Like the prophet's coming to offer a sacrifice. He's invited everybody. Oh, by the way, Dave, somebody's got to hang out with the shepherds or with the sheep. Uh, you, you go take care of that while everybody that's important comes to the party. We didn't even think to bring you in, David. You're that insignificant to our family. And Samuel says, all right, we're not even going to sit down. We can't go any farther until you bring him in. At this point in time, David is a young man. He is likely 12 or 13 years old. Put that in perspective. He's a middle schooler. Some of you middle schoolers that are in here, like, David's just starting to stink good. You know what I'm talking about? Like, like I mean, he is a young man. Like, I, and, and just... Uh, I, as I was thinking through this this week, I got to thinking, think about who your best friend was in middle school. Think about who they were. And now imagine someone comes to you and says, your best friend in middle school is going to be the president of the United States. <laughs> Whatever, right? He's going to be the king of the United States. Are you kidding me? They bring David in. Verse 12, we got to go fast. Verse 12, so he sent for him, and he had him brought in, and he was glowing with health, and he had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day forward, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And from that day forward, the name of Jesse, the city of Bethlehem, and the line of David would be associated with a king that would rule over Israel forever. And a thousand years later, Paul would take this same principle that when it comes to God, what's on the outside matters more than what is on the inside. And he would apply it to the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, he says, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things, the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. When it comes comes to the man, the woman that God uses, what is unseen is more important than what is seen. As we think about this principle moving forward through this series, and as you think about it in your own heart, I want you to begin to do some introspection. I want you to begin thinking to yourself, not what boxes do you check, but what is unseen in your heart. What is unseen in your heart? And then maybe you need to to follow that up with the second question, right? What is unseen in your heart, really? What are are those things that, that, you know what, you have been pushing down and you have been ignoring? Those things that may be getting in the way of God fulfilling his purpose in your life because you have been putting it out all of the wrong things. You've been trying to, 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 to build up the wealth and to build the bigger barns and to make your way in uh, your, your position, in your, in your job, in your, in your role, in your career. You've been trying to build the perfect family on the outside that dresses a certain way, that carries the right um, accoutrements and, 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 and all of those things and drives the right cars and has the right toys and, and checks all of the right boxes and you've been trying to get all of the right education and all of the right um, uh, 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 
qualifications and not that any of those things are wrong. But when it comes to serving God, it's what is on the inside that matters more than what is on the outside. What are those areas of pride in your life that you need to do a gut check and go, you know what, I'm out here professing the name of God and I look good to everybody else, but I'm rotten on the inside. Maybe the reason that God is rejecting you is not because you haven't met all of the outward requirements. It's because something on the inside is not the way it needs to be. Or maybe, or maybe you've bought into the lie that your enemy wants to tell you, and that is that you cannot be used because you don't have the right education, and you're not smart enough in your own eyes, and you're not pretty enough, and you don't come from the right family or the right side of the tracks, and your house isn't big enough to be used uh, by, by, by a, a home group, and, and you aren't wise enough to be able to lead a group, or, or you would never be able to know how to run the tech, and you're not good enough of a singer to get here up on the stage and do this and so that means you can't be used by God to, to advance his kingdom and you bought into the lie that it's the outward appearance that matters and when it comes to God what is unseen is always more important than what is seen so here's the question that I want you to wrestle with in the weeks that move as we move forward what is it what is it that is unseen in your heart really because what is unseen is more important than what is seen. What is it that God has for you? What is it that he might be calling you into to advance his kingdom? Because he has placed that inside of your heart. What is it in your heart that is unseen, really? Let me pray for you. God, as we move forward in this series and as we begin to talk about your utilization of, of the men and the women that, gosh, we just, we wouldn't naturally point out. We would naturally see. God, I pray that you would reveal to our own, our own selves the, the, the status, the temperature of our own heart. God, that you would, you would remind us that it's what you've placed in our heart and what you've done in our hearts that qualifies us for service, nothing else. So, Father, I pray that you would forgive me, forgive us for the times when we have made it about those check boxes that the world says that we should have. Not that they're unimportant, not that they don't matter, but, God, they don't matter near as much as what it is you're doing in our heart. And so, God, I pray that you would do that in our lives, that you would do something in our hearts so that you might utilize us for your kingdom, that you might use us in whatever way it may be, whether that's pushing buttons in our tech crew or that's um, you know, engaging with folks online or whether that's rocking babies in the nursery or standing on this platform and speaking or singing or whether it's serving the homeless in our community, or serving the needy in our, in our, in our community. God, I, I just pray that you would allow us the wisdom to know those things in our heart that need to change and those things in our hearts that can be used by you, no matter what it may be. God, I just pray that you would use us to make your name famous in the world. For your sake and for your glory. We love you and we trust you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you next week.